All right, welcome to the Players Assist. I have a very, very special guest. This this man has deposited a lot in my life, not just on the court, but I still use a lot of the wisdom and the things that 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 he's taught me in my life today. And now that I'm mentoring uh, children, I just steal a lot from his book. So I want to take the time to talk a little bit about Coach Marlin. He's uh, the all-time winners coach, not in the program, in Sunbelt in Sun Belt history. Uh, his team led the Sunbelt Conference six consecutive years, Sunbelt Coach of the Year, Coach Four Player of the Year selections, uh, NBA lottery pick, uh, Alfred Payton. He coached him as well. And uh, probably the, the biggest and most important part of his resume is he, is he coached me, yours truly. <laughs> no, but uh, but hey, Coach, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for being a guest. I know y'all have you have a busy schedule, so I appreciate you coming on with me. No, my pleasure, Jamal. I'm glad to, to visit with you as always. Yeah. No, that's that's awesome. And uh, and I'm I'm looking at y'all, you know, I keep up with you guys when I can meet, you know, I went to the rice game and things like that. Um, y'all are killing it at home, like like y'all do a lot of times. I know y'all won the whole conference last year. That was an exciting year. Uh nine and one at home. You only lost to what number 19, James Madison. Uh you're on a seven game winning streak right now. So when you have uh when you're having like Y'all are having this game and y'all on the streak. Is there something that you guys are doing different than y'all were before that you're noticing? Or or is it y'all just kind of hit your stride? No, uh, it's it's very simple, uh, JP. You know, when you win uh, several games in a row, you're doing something right. And our defense and rebounding has gotten much better uh, since you saw us play at Rice. I mean, it, the, the next week we got better, that first week of conference. And, uh, th that's the big reason. We've been able to shoot the ball. We we made it over 18 threes uh, twice this mm. this year in different games. So we, we can really shoot the ball, but it's been our defense and our rebounding um, and consistency. we got all five starters. Our post players started playing really well, and mm -hmm. uh, that's made a big difference. Yeah, and uh, even the game I went to at Rice, y'all shot the game. I mean, in the first half, y'all shot it really made, well again so made made 10 yeah 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 and uh yeah and so it's funny I, I hear you talking a lot about defense but then when I look as I kind of research some of the stats you led the league in conf or the conference in scoring six consecutive years but yet you still put a huge emphasis on defense yeah we do and and that's what uh I learned how to coach when I started and people ask me all the time are you offensive coach or defensive coach and I think I'm both, but uh, the, the defense will help you win a championship, there's no doubt. We Our teams have always been good offensively from back when you played Juwan, and we've been able to score the ball. So if we can play great defense, rebound the ball, which has been a challenge this year at times because we're not the biggest team that I've had. Right. You're, you're going to win your share of games. Yeah. And I, I just – yeah, and I remember that. I'm The defensive side of the ball was what I remember most. That's why, I, you know – uh, you know, it's funny, like looking at the offensive stats, because I think once you teach a team that defense is more important than offense, you've immediately created a better team. And that's what you taught me. So like when I look at the offensive numbers, I'm like, man, I, I mean, we did run really good offense, but the focus was always the defense. So it's just interesting how that how that kind of pans out. Um, along with other things that you've given me, I'm look, this is I don't know if you remember this. This is uh, a book you gave me my senior year. Is it was pretty empty. I tore the first couple of pages out, and that's what I'm using to do this this podcast and interview. So I meant to, you know, just thank you for that. Um, along with a bunch of other things that, you know, that you've deposited into my life. My dad, my parents, they always ask about you. I'm sorry, I'm jumping back to the introduction, but uh, you know, that that was one of the first things when I said I was doing the podcast. He was like, "Oh, I know you're gonna have Coach Marlin on," and I was like, "For sure." And uh, as I kind of go back, I want to kind of talk a little bit about. Uh, recruiting so uh one i remember when you came to my house for an in-house visit and it was very different um i had a few in-house visits you know and uh and you were the first coach that kind of came in and said hey look i'm not promising you anything you have to earn your spot um and you know if you compete then yeah you can be the point guard or, or whatever you're, you're you're searching for and that was a very different message than i was getting on the recruiting visits so it seems like you try to recruit a certain type of player like uh, that looking at it in, in kind of hindsight. I'm not sure that's the 
raccoon tactic I would use, but that's what we wanted as a family. My dad's like, oh, okay, I want him to go somewhere where he's he doesn't just inherit a job, he has to earn it. And so, uh, you know, what do you say about that? Like when you're talking to your to your players, is that pretty much still the approach? You let them know that they're going to earn everything they get. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we I, I use the good, but not great. You know, we think you're a good player. We can make you better with our uh, player development and working with our coaches. But uh, we, we look for character and guys who want us while we recruited you. And just for the record, so everyone knows, the home visit didn't happen until after his sophomore year because after his freshman year, I tried to snatch him up and it was late. <laughs> it was in it was in August and he came over. I think he and his mom came over and, and spent a day at Sam Houston. And then uh, I think the next day he, he got back home and he called me and said, Coach, I think I'm going to stay at McLennan for one more year. And, and yeah. uh, you know, and you know what? Mm. That makes me – uh want you more to want because that's the kind of person i want in our program your loyalty and your commitment and and you just didn't feel like you're ready and then obviously the next year you felt very comfortable and then right. stepped stepped right in our program won your first game at uh, missouri in the preseason nit i believe uh and ha had a great two-year career for us oh well you know it's funny you bring missouri up i <laughs> you know that that was kind of a wake-up call and 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 basically that game, that specific game, I remember very well because uh, you you pretty much caught me off guard. And I've learned to really appreciate it now. But then it was different. So basically, we're in the preseason on IT. We're, we're facing Missouri at Missouri. So, you know, it's a Big 12 school there. Soon we're going to lose. I don't start off the first half too hot. Second half, of, it's my first game. It's the jitters. It's, you know, my first Division One game. Uh, play better in the second half. Ryan Bright goes crazy. He has 28 points. But Basically, we upset Missouri at Missouri. We're going to the tunnel, about to go celebrate. And then you stop both Chris Jordan and I. And it's like, oh, no, you did. It's like you look both of us in the eyes and you're like, hey, don't come out here not ready to play again. And, and in my head, I was thinking, like, because I looked at Chris and he's been there for four years. So he knows, hey, coach isn't going to accept anything less than your best. And, 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 and he knew that. But I didn't because I'm thinking – Stat wise, I was I had like 14 points, like eight assists. And I don't even I don't think I had a turnover. So if you look at the box scores, I was fine. But at the same time, you said that's not who you're capable of being. And so I, I learned early that it wasn't really about the results for you it was where you were more focused on who I was capable of being. And that just caught me off guard because usually the results wipe away all the all your shortcomings in a game and. Yeah, just tell me about that a little bit because that, that was interesting for me. I know how I interpret it, but do you remember that? Well, it's kind of like our streak now. Uh, when we do good things, I always remind the guys, what what did we do to get here? Uh, why are we in this position? And let's keep doing the things we've been doing. And when you don't lose a game for a month like we have right now, they're on campus and people are patting them on the back, telling them how yeah. great they are. And this group's pretty grounded, so I think we're okay. But just take it day by day and and be prepared each time you come out uh, to play. And I always want your best, Jamon. I, I, and, and I appreciate you saying those things, but that that's something to me that I've always tried to do, and that's reach inside somebody and find something that they don't know that they have. And right. That, right. That, just to push them a little bit. And some guys – you know, don't don't take it. And some guys take and they turn into a totally different player in person. So that's the beauty of coaching. Yeah, it is. And, and sometimes I mean, because that I, I told you how vividly I remember that. And that's pretty much how I coach now. But it's still sometimes it rubs people the wrong way. Uh, and, you know, since I coach youth, they're not quite high level performers yet. So it comes off as if I don't like them or or something like that, where. Like you said, it's all on how they accept it. So uh, I appreciate that because I've seen I, I have a few kids that have just literally out trained the odds. They're they're under six foot, uh, you know, all those things. And now they're being able to play basketball beyond high school. So it's the players like that with that will to press through the adversity and understand that, hey, I want to be coached. And and if a kid will allow you to coach him, um, you can actually tap into his potential. Absolutely. And all the great players, you know, want to get better. Why do you think Kobe and LeBron and Michael Jordan, right. all those guys, they accept coaching 
they accept criticism. And I, I think the biggest thing with, with our recruiting and my approach to one is always to be direct and be honest, have high expectations. But, you know, be honest. You, you just said it earlier. It started with a home visit, you know, and then you, you came and you grew as a person, you grew as a player. And you helped us win a bunch of games. I don't remember how many off the top of my head, probably 45 in two years. Uh, yeah. and, and it was it was a lot of fun to, to see your growth. Yeah. And it was, it was good thing, Matt. Uh, my younger brother, same age as, as, as your son, Matt. And I remember going on a recruiting visit. And when we went into the cafeteria, I can't remember if it was a Burger King. My, my little brother was like, man, this is it. <laughs> this, this is the school. So, you know, it's funny when you go on recruiting visits on what, what people see and do. Um, but uh, I, I like to know a little bit more like in, in Louisiana, um, you know, if I'm a raging Cajun and I'm playing college basketball for you, what does a typical day look like uh, for me? Well, in the fall, we pra- in summer and fall, we practice at 830 in the morning and we we'll, we'll, can only go for an hour in the summertime because of the 20 hour uh, or excuse me, eight hours per week rule that we have four in the weight room, four on the court. So we're mm-hmm. out at, at 930. We go four days a week give them the weekends off. Uh, and then once school started, we're doing the same thing, but now we're practicing 8.30 to 11. They go to class from 11 till three. Uh, they have to go meet with their academic mentor and advisor at some point in time, almost daily, stop by the library, which is where our student academic uh, center is. And then grab some lunch and, and they come back over and shoot. We have a, a 300 club and guys try to get up 300 shots a day. And that's very competitive too. And we, we chart that having a practice facility in the locker room. So uh, guys always challenging each other, whether it's three point shots or free throws, that's always a healthy thing to have competition within a team. And then uh, guys have study hall also uh, talked about academic mentor and advisor but they'll go meet with tutors for an hour a day as well while they're in the academic center so uh it's a full day and right. and it's something that now we're up to 20 hours per week uh this semester we're practicing in the afternoon and uh didn't want to, that's by design so that we can can get more rest and make sure we're going to school and doing a great job there uh, but yeah, it's a full-time job. The travel's hard. Juwan, we've had a four-game road trip. We we played at Troy on a Wednesday night. We went from mm-hmm. there to Jonesboro, Arkansas. Played Arkansas State. Came home after the game on Saturday, and then left on Tuesday. Flew over towards you, you guys uh, home uh, and played at San Marcos. In mm-hmm. Texas State, and uh, flew. We were able to fly back home right after the game on a charter flight, and, and then we bust over to Mobile on Saturday, Friday, and played them Saturday afternoon. And wow! We won those last three games. So to be gone two weeks, and if you look at that, it's right when school started. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. What so about we, academic advisor? Are you? Are I remember Chris Thompson, uh, our academic advisor at Sam. Uh, coming with us. Do y'all have an academic advisor coming with you on those trips? On some trips, we'll take them like the tournaments and the, the MTE events, things we do in the fall if we're gone for three or four days. Uh, but during the conference season, we may take them one time. Okay. Uh, and I've, I've got a uh, young lady here named Christy Alford, mm-hmm. Juwan, and I met her uh, shoot my first day or maybe even on the interview. And mm-hmm. she was like Chris Thompson. Same thing when I met Chris. And you, you, I knew that I had two special ladies that really cared about the guys and we, we're going to hold them accountable, right. yet g- give them some support and love and, and try to get them through college and get their degree. So, yeah, that's that's a big part of it as well. Yeah. But, we, I, but, um... but Juwan, we missed we missed the first three days of class. And then we came back and then over the weekend and Monday was MLK day. And then Tuesday, uh, we had a freeze here and school, all the schools in Louisiana were shut down. And then we left Tuesday afternoon to go to San Marcos. Our first class date was on that Thursday. And we went Thursday and Friday and then bus Friday afternoon to Mobile. (laughs) Yeah. 
Yeah, and that, it's interesting because I was uh, I was reading up on you and uh, at Louisiana Lafayette, your teams have posted eight out of ten of the top GPAs in program history, and uh, you know is basically as we because uh, I want to ask you some recruiting questions and I want to kind of wonder where that priority list is when you talk about uh, recruiting. I remember you know we had a special group that uh, that was really good academically. So this doesn't happen on accident. I know you're doing it on purpose. So like when you're recruiting, where does that land? Because you you don't become uh, top 10, eight out of 10 GPAs on accident. Well, we try to recruit quality students. You know, it starts as a person, then as a student, and then as a basketball player third. And uh, But the academics are important. They were important to me. Uh, just do your work again like we talked about on the court, JP, be the best you can be. And everybody's mm -hmm. different. And some guys, as you know, are two, five students, and you got other guys that are three, six students. Right. You know? And the guys, and I just expect them, based off what they did in high school, I challenge them to, to be as good as they can be. And uh, we've been very fortunate area. We had the student athlete, academic athlete of the year, a couple times in that stretch when you played and Ryan Bright being one of them, I think Barkley Faulkner may have won at one time, mm -hmm. but uh, really proud of what, what all of my guys have done academically and, and over, over a long journey. So we do put a little emphasis on it. And I tell them if in recruiting, if, if I'm, I need a guard like you, uh, a point or combo, and you got a, a 3.0 GPA and the other guy's got a 2.4, then, I mean, I'm leaning to go with the other guy just because right. I know that, that he's going to be eligible. Same yeah. thing when you, get, when you get out of college. You know, people are looking at you. It's competitive out there in the workforce. And if you have a great GPA and, and you're head to head with somebody, then they're going to probably do the same thing. Yeah, it's a good sign of discipline. I, I don't even know if you remember this. There's a kid I used to, to work with. Uh, he's, he's People may know him. I'm not going to use his name. But basically, um, you were asking me about him. And I said, hey, and you were looking at him a little bit. And I said, hey, coach, he's got NBA size, NBA athleticism. Man, he just don't have much of a motor. And then uh, you, you basically knew and had his grades. And you were just like, OK, well, he doesn't have a motor in the classroom. And then you basically said, look. JP, I don't have time to put a motor in somebody. And that made me think because I was like, man, this kid lost a huge opportunity uh, to play division one ball because he didn't have a motor. He just didn't want it bad enough. He didn't discipline himself. And and that stuck with me. So. Uh, so, yeah. Do you do you remember that story, first of all? Yeah. No, I do. OK. OK. Yeah. Sure so. Do. So no, yeah, so with that, with that, is is I always try to tell kids the importance of 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 grades, and um and keeping them up so you can keep the opportunities because coaches are looking at all of that. And when you get to the level of Division One player or guard, I mean, the things that are separating you are are small, or we're talking GPA, but seemingly small. Yeah, it's. Uh... You, a lot of background check goes into it, talking to different people at the school, the counselors, maybe the principal at some schools, uh, you know, certainly the coaches, assistant coaches in your situation where you played high school and JUCO. So there's double those amount of people almost. But we try to touch base with all of them uh, to see not only academically, but what kind of drive and, and uh, self-discipline you have. You know, as far as right. as working hard in the classroom on the court, and I mean, we're playing a team tonight. We we I, the scout report two of them. You know, high motor, uh, good on the glass, and as a coach, uh, I think it's very important to look for guys that that play really hard because you think you can make them play hard, but if you have right. a coach effort, as you know, Juwan, then you're 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 going to have a long year. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. it doesn't matter how talented you are. So a lot of guys just if they'll play hard and defend and rebound the ball, things that we talked about are part of our success right now. Then coaches will look look at them and, and uh, you know, d dig into their background and see if they're good enough and if they're what they need. Right. What about uh like the recruiting process? Like, what do you go? Through? I know everything is different. This is kind of a loaded question, but like, what's the process when you go and you're searching and looking for for players and talent? Like, 
there, there's a bunch of avenues. Kids can send highlights. Uh, I don't know if there's recruiting services, uh, different things like that. What's what's the process like? Yeah, all, all the above. Um, yeah. You know, we we love to recruit Louisiana kids first. We've got eight on our roster right now. Uh, I think it means more to them. They grow up knowing of our success. They go through junior high and high school and, and know what we've done. And uh, I think there's more ownership if you have local players. Now, we're in a good area. We're close to Houston. We're, we're on I-10. Certainly, we're close to New Orleans. Uh, you know, and get, getting into Mobile, Mississippi Mobile, the, the coast, the panhandle, the Florida right there, uh, which is where we have a lot of contacts in all those mm -hmm. places. But it really doesn't matter where you are. It's it's what can you do for our team? Can you impact winning for our team? Right. Uh, so we use scouting services. We and of course those are getting very expensive today, Juwan. And you know a lot of guys are good, and then some guys do a halfway job and want to, you know, pick up five hundred or seven hundred fifty dollars from you. We just don't do that. We right. we feel like we know. Um, get a ton of emails from parents, you know, and parents think that their, their child's the best. And I understand that. And, you know, just like with you and your parents, you know, I, I love both of them uh, and wanted to see you do well. And I was kind of your parent away from home and uh, I'm going to hold you the same standards that, that they would. All right. And so, but it, it, the emails that we get probably aren't as important. Uh, and then one time you don't check on one and, you know, th three or four years later, the kid winds up in the NBA. So that makes you <laughs> delve. De and that's happened to me once. And so we delve into it pretty good now and try to make sure we're getting the, the right player uh, right. for our, our need. And that's usually through uh, it's not usually a parent uh, sending you emails or tapes. It's usually a contact. Uh, that that this that that you trust trust their basketball knowledge or is it a random like no and I tell I tell one thing I've always done Juwan I, I've got a lot of friends in the business I've done this for a long time and uh, I've I've got a guy that's one of my best friends and he, he's a uh, coach at uh, University of Central Florida and when there's a kid in Florida or my assistants will ask about a guy they like this guy I'll kind of cross check with him. And get and get his reference and you know and I trust him totally. And if he says the kid's not good enough, then I drop him and move on. But yeah. he, if if he says he's a guy that could go rebound the ball for you, do this, then you know we we jump in there. So yeah. I've got people like that that really kind of confirm and second my decision to recruit and or sign a certain player. Okay, yeah, and and so when you're um looking at players is there a situation like i try to remind players like <laughs> we stay in an age where there's always a camera there's always cell phones and it's like you never know who's in the gym you should always be giving your best do you have like a story i know it chris jordan i believe y'all recruited tj finette from hitchcock and then end up getting chris kind of by accident do you have stories like that where we're just basically reminding kids hey you need to always be giving your best because you never who's watched. I'm in gym sometimes. I have connections and, and I talk to you about players all the time, but I'll be in a gym and kids are goofing off. But do you have stories of um, where some where you recruiting somebody else and you end up getting another guy? Does that happen yeah. a lot? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And TJ, you're right. That was our, I think our second year maybe or third year at, at, at Sam. And we went after TJ and didn't get him, but while we were there, we, we said, "Guy, we like this guy right here too," and he's mm -hmm. kind of under the radar. And he was being recruited a little bit. Chris was, and then we wound up home visit. Same thing. Great family, mother and grandmother. And we were able to to sign him and get him there, and he redshirted his first year, and then made all conference first team his last year. I mean, just had had a, had a really good career. He steadily got better. And, uh, again, he was our kind of guy, Juwan, like right. you guys that, that took care of their business in the classroom and wanted to come and get better every day and just loved the sport, you know, and that, mm -hmm. that's another thing in recruiting that I didn't mention is that do you, do you like basketball or do you love it? Yeah. And, and you, I, I know where you and I stand on that one. So yeah. 
uh, it's important for these young people. And you can tell sometimes I, I, I've had some guys that I, I thought really loved the game so much that I gave them an opportunity to walk on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny. I'll, I'll talk to parents sometimes and, you know, and I'll just be honest with them. I'm like, well, look right now your kid likes basketball. He doesn't love it. No, no, he loves it. He loves it. Coach. I'm like, well, you, you're looking at somebody who loves it. I, I recognize somebody who loves it. He likes it. And because uh, if he loved it, he could get up at six in the morning, then go to school, get his workout in, then come back after. But she's like, oh, he'd never do that. I was like, yeah, because he likes it. He doesn't love it. So the perception means a lot. That's that's everybody's own reality, their own reality. But um, yeah, I, I kind of have a lot of conversations about what love looks like and what like looks like. And I think the only way you can be uh, a division one player, especially if you're undersized. So that, that, that would kind of lead into my next question is if you're let's say six, three and under, what are some intangibles that you would have to have in order to play at the level that you're at? Well, one, one certainly would be to be to love the game, but I, th I think six, three is a little bit high, to be honest, Juan. I used to say if a guy's six feet or less, mm -hmm. then he has to be really special. Okay. Uh, and he has to do something that can impact the team that other people can't bring, whether mm -hmm. it's be a, the best passer, uh, you know, the best defensive player, uh, you know, the, the best teammate. He right. has to he has to do something to to be special because the size is a, is a disadvantage. And uh, as you get up the chain and go to low division one or mid division one or high division one, you know, bigger, stronger, faster in every area. And, you know, I, I'll go back to, uh, you know, Ron Bright, the guy that you played with. I mean, Ron was really good. If he was two inches taller, you know, yeah. he, he would have played at a, in the Big 12. But yeah. he just he was a little bit short for his position, but was super skilled and, and a great player and an even better person. Right, right. I uh, that's that's kind of a funny story. Now that you say that, um, I talk about smaller players. I was a smaller player, and I still remember I was watching. I I used to love the Discovery Channel, and I was watching an eagle capture a snake. And basically, if the eagle was wrestling with him on the ground, the snake would win. That's his habitat. So how eagles would win is they'd take the snake up, take him out of his habitat. the The snake is more concerned about survival than actually attacking the eagle, and he'd get went wind down. But my point is. I always used to think like, man, how could I become a snake on the ground in basketball and become an eagle in the air? Meaning I could do multiple things. And an example would be I struggle guarding bigger guards and maybe I need to make sure I'm in the best shape so I could guard that bigger guard full court. So now he's less of himself. And then maybe he's dribbling up court and he's learning to get off the ball so he doesn't get tired. So now I'm trying to play a mental game with him. Oh yeah, you better get off the ball. So now it's a pride thing. So now he has to dribble up against me, not because he can't get it up, but I think I'm in better shape than him. I play better tired than he does. And then after a timeout, we come out and maybe I'll say, hey, hey, CJ, uh, hey, I'm not guarding a shooter. I got big help. And he's like, oh, oh, I can't shoot. And 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 in my head, I'm thinking you've just lost the mental battle because the reason you're a division one player is because you're a tall, longer point guard that draws fouls. You get downhill. I can't stop you from getting downhill and getting offensive rebounds. But if you're going to shoot threes, I can. And so basically I was trying to become really good in these other areas since I didn't feel like I had a physical advantage anywhere. And so I always try to tell the young players that I'm uh, coaching and dealing with that you have to learn these intangibles. And usually what separates you is what's up here. And you can outplay and outduel somebody who's more talented if you can outthink that player. And so, uh, so that's pretty much how I view it for younger players. You just have to find some things since you didn't hit the genetic lottery you need to find other ways to make yourself valuable on the court to play at and the level the, you want to play at. And that's the majority of the, of the high school players. Uh, you know, they, there's a small percentage that goes and plays college basketball or division one basketball. So they, they have to have something special. The, the thing that you did great, Juwan, was a, a, the mental aspect. Yeah. Physically you were maybe outmanned uh, certain games, but you turned around and, and your approach and the mental toughness that you had and knowing that you were going to be in better shape, et cetera. Um, and one other thing I didn't mention about being under six feet. I mean, go, what, what most people under six feet are what? Very quick and have a good speed. Right. So, don't, you know, speed, speed kills. And right. I, I just assume have great speed at size. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, 
Yeah, and that's and that's 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 the other thing is as you talk about great speed and uh, affecting the game in different ways. I I remember a story. I want to say it's Marquette, Steve Novak. They did it, but you basically did it with me. And what it was was you had me sit out of practice. And basically kind of the rules were get on the treadmill, run sprints and talk. And, you know, uh, this is my first. I didn't know why I was sitting out. I wasn't injured. But basically it was like, hey, if my point guard's injured, how do we play without him? I'm, I'm, I'll let you explain the, the rationale behind it. But as we're in practice, I remember this. I was kind of sitting on the sideline, just sitting. And you're like, well, what are you doing? Like, you're not talking to your team. So basically, can you affect the game with your voice when you're not on the court? Can you tell and let other players what you know? That's what I took from it. Um, and it was it was a unique, it was so unique because I, was, I wasn't I was really ready for that because you didn't warn me or anything. You just said, hey, you're going to sit out of practice and condition and talk. So, like, uh, if you remember that, let me, like, kind of enlighten, like, the whole thought behind that. Uh, well, I, I don't remember it, Juwan, to be totally candid. Uh, oh, really? I, I, do, I do think it's important, though, and there had to be some reason why I held you out uh, of practice, but I wanted you to stay engaged and, and be a coach, right? That's You were a coach on the floor for us, and I wanted right. you to be a coach off the floor, and if you couldn't go, continue to talk, encourage your teammates, uh, be the leader that you are to take us to a championship. Yeah. And that's uh, I'm trying to think back of who it was. There's when you talked to me a little bit about it, it was a uh, I think it's Marquette. Steve Nogak played at Marquette and there was a point guard, Dominique, Dominique. Anyway, there, there, there was two top players that they had on that team and that coach had did it or, or something like that, from what I remember. But yeah, but that no, that's I, I always go back to like my time when I played in college. And I tell parents and players, I was like, look, I grew so much, especially mentally, the mental toughness part of the game, because I was told what to do. You know, there wasn't I didn't have the option to choose the the easier route. So, like, you couldn't help but grow in that environment. So I spent a lot of time, um, you know, with the teams that I coach and trying to get them in the mindset of being told what to do so they can become who, who they're going to be, because kids are always going to choose the. Uh, OK, gotcha. Kids are always going to choose the easier route. Uh, they're going to choose comfort over discomfort. And uh, and and it seemed like as we were going through it, it was it was kind of a adversity builds you up, you know, as a, as a player. So it was like you were trying to Im create adversity if you could. So is that still kind of your your look at? It? I mean, we had drills with the two on five drill where you're creating more adversity, more talking, more you, you have to to be successful. Is yeah. that more of a point that you try to make when you do, when you coach? Yeah, and I was going to say this earlier, Juwan. You were talking about how much defense we placed and ingrained that in your head. And that was the first thing that I thought of was five on two. and uh, It's some mental toughness, uh, uh, physical as well. You've got to sprint back. You have to communicate with your teammate. It's just you two. And you got five people in the ball coming at you. And you got to stop the ball and guard the basket at the same time. And then on passes, you have to – to communicate and, and continue to guard the ball. Somebody's guarding the ball, somebody's guarding the basket. So uh, we, we don't do that as much anymore. Uh, I know you're probably disappointed in that. Yeah, but we, we, we do it different ways, but uh, we still do it a little bit, but not every day to start practice. And <laughs> let, let, I used to have you guys out there till your tongues were hanging out, <laughs> so tired, because it'll wear you down in a hurry. Yeah. But, but no, I, I think that, uh, aspect of it is is important uh the the, the mental piece uh, and trying to help guys grow and look at different areas you know when when like when you set out you look you, you've been injured before Jamon missed a game or practice you know whether it's just an ankle or whatever and sometimes when the game's taken away from you then you learn more about the game yeah. And, you, and you respect the game more when you come back. Right. And they say practice should be harder than the games. And I, as I, as you were naming that drill, for those who don't know what it is, is two guards are back and then it's five players coming at you. And, you know, our job is, of course, they're going to score, but make them make multiple passes, make it take longer to score through communication. But we had rebounding drills, three on four. Uh, I remember we were about to play uh, – U of H or Arizona, we had seven people pressing us. So, like I said, it, I could tell you were an adversity guy to, to try to overload us to, so we can be prepared for 
so the game would become easier uh, than the practices, really. No, and, and uh, you're absolutely right. You talked about uh, being uncomfortable earlier, and we teach our guys still today. We talk about it all the time. You got to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. And another thing for the high school guys out there, one thing that always is different is when you get to college, the pace of the game is is better. Whether it's at uh, you know the Texas JUCO league that you played in at McLennan or at Sam Houston in the Southland, wherever you play, um, it, it's just going to be a higher level. And you've got to get comfortable and not play fast when the game's going fast. Right. You know, and I think I used to use this with you guys too, Juwan. I know I did with you. As a point guard, you can't just drive 65. You, you get to school zones. You got to stop. You got to slow down. You got to yep. stop, start, pick your spots. Uh, yep. So I think that's very important. Yeah, pace. You you have a point guard right now that does that does that well. I, I love the way uh, Themis plays, and he does. He plays with a with a lot of pace, and uh, and and I, I I really appreciate that. It was it was kind of I, I don't know if you were telling me this, Sam, but it was basically if you're one speed, you're slow. If you're multiple speeds, you're fast. And uh, and when that kind of made sense, and when I had to guard it, when we made it a drill, I start realizing like, man, this is. I hate guarding the guy that's going second gear, then fourth, then first, then third. And so th those are some of the things. I want to ask you a few things that you would kind of advise young people. Like one of that, that being one, how to run or attack space, how to play without the ball, how to play with pace. Um, if you're a young person that, you know, for all the, the hoopers, college is eventually the next step in the next dream. Is there anything that just jumps right off that you would that you would tell a young person now? I think one of the main things is to we talk about being a good teammate, but be a, be a great cutter, you know, be, be a great screener, do something fundamentally sound that you don't think is important. But as you know, Juwan, all, all areas are important. And, right. And the game at any level, whether it's bitty basketball here in Louisiana or, uh, you know, Division One basketball in, in Texas or anywhere else, um, you know, that's always important uh, to go back to the fundamentals. People will call me and say, I'm coaching this fifth grade team. What I need to do, teach them spacing, teach them how to cut, uh, but but work on ball handling and shooting. And You know, we had a five minute uh, period every beginning of practice when you were with me at Sam. I don't do it anymore, but we used to start every practice with fundamental drills. And mm -hmm. one day we'd pass, one day we'd work on ball handling, just for five minutes. Uh, yeah. But it was to give you guys confidence. So I think you always go back to the fundamentals of the game. Yeah, and, yeah. I, um... and, and, and if you're the best, Juwan, at a certain skill, then you can play on any team in, in the world. And the biggest example of that is if you're the best rebound on your team, you're going to play. If you're the best defensive player on your team, you're going to play. All right. If you're the best ball handler on your team, you're going to play. Yeah. So I, and, and certainly, you know, if you're the best scorer, you're going to play. So look at look at those. And if you can just master one of those skills. And my mm -hmm. favorite one is and I just saw a tweet on this the other day. Um, Dennis Rodman had a four game stretch where he, he or three game stretch where he had 25, 28, 26 rebounds with no points. Mm. No points. Yeah. But he was the best rebounder in the world, right? Yeah. And that's why Michael Jordan went to Vegas to go get him out of that hotel and bring him back <laughs> to the Bulls because he wanted that's to win right. the championship. Well, it's funny you said that. If you're the best, I, I, you know, you when I start training, I tell kids, hey, I want you to be good at your God-given ability first. If you're rough and tough, get rebounds. Be the best screener on the team. Like, be, get the best score open. Um, you know, if you're a good ball handler. But, like, most of the time – you know, I tell kids this. There's one ball and there's 10 players on the court. You have the ball 10% of the time if everything's equal. Well, you sub out the game. You're not the primary ball handler. Maybe you only have the ball 5% of the time. Most kids put their whole world in that 5%. Oh, you, you just named a Dennis Rodman stat. Most kids aren't willing to have zero, two, or four points and leave a game happy. But there's so much other things at basketball that make you valuable. Can you hold that 20-point a game score to 10? You know, can you keep our possessions? Can you... You know, so 
so those those are the things that you know I, I like that you brought up because you said are you the best rebounder the dribbler none of those things have anything to do with dribbling cutting those don't even have anything to do with you having the ball initially so if if kids learn to value some things that other people aren't thinking about i really uh, and I'm, I'm glad you said it instead of me because this is this is the next step this is where they want to go so um i really hope kids start to appreciate the other 95 percent because those are the things that really really separate you and that coaches all coaches want to win you you told me that and if that's the case then make sure you could do those other things because scoring ugh, that's a that's a big market it's a really really big market you know out of, out of the kids that you recruit i mean i know you know if you're playing division one ball everybody could score at the high school level but how many do you come in expecting them to be some type of primary scorer anyway out of the 12 roster spots that you have well they all do uh juan you know they the scoring is as you said everything goes back to scoring who scores the most points who hits the game winning shot uh and there's so much more to it than that uh, and one one thing that i want to go back to you you were talking uh just a minute ago about 10 percent of the time you know and I, i've had point guards before that knew their job and they they that, but they also knew the two two's position small forward to power forward. they knew every position where they're supposed to be on every play right you know as a point guard that's part of your job but this this kid played the center for us and was mobile and did a fantastic job uh just thinking the game you know seeing not only what's your guy how he's guarding you what he's doing but what's going on with the other four guys mm -hmm. you know? and, yeah and certainly if a guy turns his head defensively then you know you got one of those guys got to cut to the basket and get an easy shot so uh we talk about eye discipline a lot now and, yeah you know fundamentally the spacing we know what we're supposed to be defensively positioning wise but you, you got you still got it's the old still got to see both right ball you man there we go well you know that was always tough for me if you if you if you remember <laughs> um but no i you know that that's funny i bring that up because you know i'm legally blind in my right eye for those that don't know and uh the funny thing about our situation is my dad used to tell me hey don't tell coaches that you know you have a you know an eye situation going on because you know that'll hurt you you're a point guard I'm pretty sure most coaches want their coach, uh, their point guards to see with both eyes. So um, we were in the game, and I used you you had me taking the ball out, and uh, for whatever reason, this this one play I'd miss the slip on the opposite block um, on my right side, and I don't, I'm not sure exactly when you found out. It was either later in my junior year or probably early in my senior, and you're like, you had me in the film. We're like, Juwan, why do you keep missing this pass? And then that's kind of when I opened up and said, hey, coach, look, I'm I can't even see out of this side. So uh, I I remember coming out to practice, uh, you set up more of the screens for me to come off, you know, with my right hand versus left. Even though I was kind of different. I drew with my left a lot more. Uh, you would change the out of bounds plays. And sometimes you let Shamir take it out instead of me. Mm -hmm. So I really like the attention to detail it and how like you uh, <laughs> I mean, you just took it in stride. It was just another thing that you're like, OK, well, hey, you're here. Let's keep it moving. Let me adjust what I do for you. And that, that was one of the things I can still remember back. And I appreciate because that's what we did. We just adjusted how we played. Well, I, I certainly knew about your eye, Juwan, but you played so well. I, I, you didn't miss anything. But then the certain out of bounds play on the weak side, we're going to get a layup. And you missed it two or three times, you know, over a couple of games. And, and then that's what yeah. Brought the discussion up to the coaching staff, man. Like, what? Why is Juwan missing this? And, and right, that, you know. But uh, hey, that's a credit to you. That's a that's one of my favorite stories, and and I'm glad you brought it up because you've overcome a lot in in your life, and and uh, you know, certainly so so proud of of what you've done and accomplished, and what you continue to do, and that's try to impact young people. Well, I appreciate that, Coach. Well, I. I appreciate you coming on. I know you all have a game today, so I and I know you have a busy schedule for it. Just you coming out and taking the time to uh, to just talk to the to the guests that I have and to me. You know, I I don't take it lightly. I thank you for that and and good luck. Today should be the eighth. You know, you're at home, so I know it's a home game. And uh, hey, let's keep the keep the tradition going. Yeah, the team that plays the best will win. That's for sure. And hopefully, yeah. we've been playing good basketball, so hopefully, we play good tonight. Awesome. Hey, Coach, thanks again. I really appreciate it. 
All right, Juwan. Appreciate you, man. All right. Later.